So the title of my talk today is, Are Robots the Answer? Are they the solution? Do they make the world a better place, a richer place, a happier place? Neil is a scholar of the robotic revolution, of AI, of machine learning, and as I suggested, maybe it's not appropriate for me to speak for him, but I think his conclusion is mixed, he's ambivalent, he's not sure. And of course, the reason why Neil isn't sure, the reason why we don't know yet, is because it hasn't happened. The AI revolution lies in the future. It's something that we're on the cusp of. When you talk more than 10 or 15 years, you're throwing your hands up in the air and you're saying, who knows? 10 or 15 years ago, you barely had Google. 25 years ago, you didn't have the internet. So the reason why we don't know whether or not robots are the answer is because we don't have the evidence. It's a question of how you feel. Neil, as an extremely erudite scholar, is ambivalent. Elon Musk, a great technologist, is worried. So is Nick Bostrom. So is Stephen Hawking. So is Bill Gates. So is Jan Tallinn, the founder of Skype. So worried, indeed, that he's put his money to founding a center for existential study at Cambridge University in England. There are other technologists who are less worried, who says, don't worry, computers will never rule us. So how do we determine if, indeed, robots are the answer? Is this just speculative? Is this something that we just need to sit around and imagine the future? That's one way of doing it, but we can perhaps leave that to the fiction writers, the Dave Edgars of their age, who imagine the future, who create it, who tell, if you like, lies about it, the great science fiction writers. But it's the responsibility of people like Neil and myself, analysts, non-fiction writers, non-fiction thinkers, to figure this future out. So how do we do it? And this, I think, is where history comes in, over the street, you have a museum of the future. I don't quite know what that means, a museum of the future, because a museum of things of the past, the future hasn't happened yet. But I would argue that the real museum of the future is history. The real museum of the future is learning from the past, because for us to determine whether or not Robots are the answer. We need to think to ourselves, well, what's happened in the past? Maybe nothing exact. There haven't been robots in the past, but there have been vast technological revolutions that have radically upset, disrupted, to use a popular Silicon Valley term, society. So what can we learn from history? How do we make sense of this great revolution that Neil is describing, because it is a great revolution. It's as profound as anything has happened since the beginning of the 19th century. Now, some of you may recognize this guy, Lord Byron, great poet, English orientalist. I'm not sure if he ever came to the, 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 the Gulf, but he certainly was a great admirer of romantic cultures. Byron made a very famous speech in 1812 in the House of Lords in England, in London where he defended the Luddites. If you remember, at the beginning of the 19th century, we were on the verge of an equivalent, radical disruption of our world. But rather than AI, rather than robots, that disruption was machinery. Machinery was radically changing the nature of labor, what it meant to work. We had, to put it very vaguely, the machine, the factory, replacing the agricultural laborer. We had this great shift from a rural world to an industrial urban world. Byron, like many other romantics, I don't know whether we would call them left or right romantics, but romantics bemoaned this great technological revolution. We'd all like to be Lord Byron, of course, and we all like to imagine that we're defending the rights of people who were bemused by this change. 
Byron spoke on behalf of the Luddites. These were the manual laborers of the last part of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, whose livelihood, whose sense of identity was radically disrupted, undermined, destroyed by the Industrial Revolution. Now, some people would say, well, Byron was a reactionary. Byron has to understand that all technology creates vast, dramatic social change. But if you look into the eyes of that guy, it's all very well to rationalize. But most people don't have this grasp of great historical circumstance, of great historical change. And today, that Luddite, that manual laborer, whose livelihood, whose essence, whose sense of identity, whose community was radically disrupted by the Industrial Revolution, that light might be all of us. Neil mentioned the, the white-collar workers. I won't make any jokes about white-hatted workers here. But we're all professionals. We're lawyers. We're doctors. We're members of the government. We're all trained in the erudition, in the science, in the language of the Industrial Revolution. We're all at threat. So look at that guy, he's not as foreign as some of us might like to think. Now the Industrial Revolution, of course, created in 200 years a period of great unrest and progress. Indeed, the last 200 years, I would argue, in historical terms, have been dominated more than anything else by the conflict between labor and capital, the conflict between the worker and the owner of the factory, and the demands of those workers, the demands of those workers to be prayed properly, to allow to organize, to improve the conditions of work in the factory. At the time when Byron was making his famous speech in the House of Lords, 14, 11, 10-year-old children were allowed to work in factories. Over the last 200 years, there's been a profound revolution in labor. The working class over the last 200 years acquired rights. Democracy emerged, the backbone of democracy being the very professional class. Neil's white-collar workers, the doctors, the lawyers, the engineers, the experts who have given in Western democracies their stability. It hasn't always, of course, been good, but government has always been central. It's really important to remember this. We're at the World Government Summit. Outside, there's something called the government of the edge. I don't know what that means. Government is always in the center. It was the center of the Industrial Revolution, and it needs to be the center of our AI age. Now, some of you will recognize this gentleman. Bismarck, the great chancellor of Germany, the man who united Germany in the last part of the 19th century. He was the founder of welfare state. He was the one who provided the infrastructure in Germany for providing unemployment payments and the other necessary infrastructure which guaranteed that the workers didn't revolt, that they joined this world, that they weren't Luddites. It's important to remember that the history of the last 200 years has been determined by state policy towards workers, pensions, insurance, unemployment, the creation of a health system, and all the other centralized achievements which I think distinguish civilized societies from those which are less civilized. Hasn't always been easy. The Russian Revolution, of course, broke out because of workers' rights. The Russian Revolution was a demand of workers to take control of factories. It was a failure. But again, I think it's important to understand that if we're to make sense of the AI revolution, we won't have a Russian Revolution, but we will have revolutions guaranteed against what are seen to be injustices. For those of you who are following the American election, this sense of anxiety of a white working class is already manifesting itself in the enormous support for radical candidates like Bernie Sanders and, and uh, Donald Trump. Now, in a sense, of course, the history of the Industrial Age ended in 1989 with the collapse of the Berlin Wall. And in a sense, that was the apogee of the Industrial Age. 
the failure of the Russian Revolution to realize the works of the working class, and the success of Western models for representing workers, the Bismarckian model, if you like. And at the same time, 1989, that the wall came down that marked the end of the great chapter, the great industrial chapter in world history, Tim Berners-Lee in Geneva created the World Wide Web, a new revolution, a new technological upheaval which changes everything. Now, as I said, this has resulted, in my view at least, in the appearance of more monopolies. It wasn't the democratic outcome that many people believed. The two, the four largest companies, for example, now in the world are Google, Microsoft, Facebook, uh, and, and Apple. So, in a sense, this revolution hasn't been successful. In terms of robots, the idea of the robot always existed before the internet, before the history of distributed intelligence. There was a, a Czech writer called Karl Kapak who invented the term robots in a, in a play in 1921. Uh, but the idea of intelligence, of AI, was perhaps founded in many ways uh, by Alan Turing, the great English scientist. Some of you may have seen the imitation game with Turing and the foundation of computer science and the emergence of the digital revolution in the 1940s. We see the coming together of robots and the network. Now, they exist in a sense in parallel, but they're so entangled that it's increasingly hard to actually separate the internet revolution from the computer revolution from the rise of the robots. This is the name of a book by Martin Ford, The Rise of the Robots, that won the Financial Times Award for Best Book of the Year last year. Ford was, was warning us about the implications of employment. Now, Neil is right to say that there are many aspects of the robot revolution which are beneficial, certainly when it comes to self-driving cars. There's no doubt that saving the lives of many innocent passengers and pedestrians is of enormous benefit. But the great issue that confronts all of us, it's still a theoretical issue, and interestingly enough, Neil and I both show this same slide, the, the Oxford report a few years ago, a couple of years ago, which reported that 47% of current jobs will be endangered by the AI revolution. Now, who knows how they came up with 47? It's a dramatic term. It, why it shouldn't be 48 or 49 or 51 or 45? It's entirely speculative. But the report of these Oxford researchers shows that many of our most traditional occupations, from manual labor to driving, that's, of course, Neil's self-driving car, they're all threatened by this revolution. And it's not just manual laborers. It's not just people working in the supermarket. It's not just stacking shelves. It's not just cab drivers and bus drivers and gardeners. It's also the future of the professions. A new book that argues that every aspect of the artificial intelligence revolution is actually challenging every profession, from law to medicine to engineering to teaching. Neil said that the artificial intelligence revolution, I can't remember he said, would blow the hat or blow the roof off teaching. Neil Diamantis yesterday said that it would mean that we'd all get free teaching. We'd all get artificial intelligent friends, apps that help us learn. But what becomes of teachers in that world? The free revolution is great for Google, who sell advertising around it, but what becomes of teachers? The backbone, in many ways, of our 19th and 20th century industrial democracy and cultural democracy. So all this stuff is in re increasingly critical for us to think about. We don't know the implications yet, but we need to think of radical solutions. So increasingly, some countries, Switzerland, for example, and others in, in, in Silicon Valley are coming up with the idea of a minimum wage, a guaranteed minimum wage, because there's increasing concern, belief amongst scientists, venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, that the jobs aren't there and they're not going to be replaced. Now, of course, in Byron's age, the Luddite was replaced by the factory worker. But there's no guarantee of that. Because it's happened in the past doesn't mean it will happen in the future. And Neil's AI 
bots, these apps, these intelligent algorithms. Sure, there'll be jobs for humans. They'll manage some of them. Not all of us are going to be unemployed. There will be the emergence of great new companies in the AI world. But the reality is that most of us probably will not be employed in this world. It will not be an age of full employment. There's nothing guaranteed about that. There's nothing inevitable about it. So what do we do? What do we do in a technological age where most of us have nothing to do? What do we do when most of us can't work? Now, we all fall back on education. I always argue that when people fall back on education, it means they have no clue. You come to events like this, and everyone says at the end, well, the solution is education. That means that no one really has any idea. You'd give it to the teachers, but we've just made all the teachers unemployed. So what do we do? One idea is to pay everyone a minimum wage, to guarantee that they won't starve, that they'll be able to feed and clothe themselves and their families. Some of you may be horrified with this, but what's the alternative? Mass starvation? Donald Trump? You laugh, it's not that funny, I live in America. <laughs> now, Neil's right. Uh, I wrote this piece, just because robots won't enslave us today doesn't mean AI will be safe forever. But we can't worry about the very distant future. That is for science fiction writers, that's for the ballads, that's for the real fiction writers. But for us, thinking about the next 15 or 20 years, we have to acknowledge that we're on the brink of something of enormously disruptive change, much more dramatic, much more disruptive than has happened over the last 25 years. The internet, Facebook and Google and all these companies, I think, in historical terms, will appear minimal. We might be simply footnotes to this next, grave, next wave of innovation, of technological revolution, whether it's AI, the Internet of Things, 3D printing, which are all kind of put together. So what do we do? What do we do? There is only one solution. There isn't distributed solutions. There isn't free technology. There is no third way. This is the role of government. I was talking to an Estonian technologist at lunch yesterday. And he said to me, and the Estonians know this stuff, I think, as well as anyone, he said to me, nothing replaces government. In the 19th century, the Bismarcks and the other statesmen and politicians of the age confronted the problems, the injustices of this revolution. They gave workers unemployment pay to guarantee that they wouldn't riot, that they wouldn't rob the rich. We can only rely on politicians. Politics has to reinvent itself. Politics certainly isn't ideal. But the idea of politics on the edge, the idea that politics can become Uber or Airbnb is simply absurd. The only way politics works at our time of great anxiety is to have trustworthy, credible politicians who take responsible action. Now, my final slide is of Margaret Vestager, who is the EU's commissioner of antitrust. She's from Denmark, an elected politician who now has a non-elected role at the EU. She's not Bismarck. She certainly doesn't look like it. But she is an example of a politician emerging to take difficult decisions. In Europe, we, or not we, Europeans have the problem of the monopolies, and she's willing to take on these American monopolists. It's different from the challenge of AI. But politicians in this new age of anxiety have to stand up to this challenge. The thing that most worries me is not so much the technological revolution. We've lived through that many times before. The problem is our lack of faith in politics. The problem is the lack of credibility of politicians. The problem is the rise of the outsider, the Trump, the Corbyn, the Sanders the people who blame the establishment, who won't take responsibility, who promise simple solutions. So if we're going to solve this next great chapter, and it can be a great chapter in world history, in the history of our collective civilization, if we are indeed going to make robots the answer, we have to, because we can't stop technology. 
It has its own logic, its own inevitability. We need to reintroduce politics and politicians and government into this mix. We don't nationalize it. We don't legislate it or regulate it to death. But without some element of regulation, without some element of political control, without the wise getting involved in this world and making sure that technology makes us happy and doesn't enslave us, then I'm afraid robots won't be the answer. Thank you.